Good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. We'll be beginning in verse 15 here in just a moment. If you're uh, new to Christ Church and this is your first time visiting, my name is Mark. I have the privilege of being one of the ministers, and we're grateful that you've joined us for worship today. We're, A, excited that you worship Jesus, and uh, we're very pleased that you would choose to worship him with us today. So we hope you feel welcome. Uh, If you weren't here last week, Uh, because of travel or vacation or whatever the case might have been, we gave an update on the Generations campaign, and I would encourage you to go online. You can see the video of it, or you can uh, download the podcast, and there's an update on the Generations campaign, which is our initiatives uh, as we go forward. I encourage you to update yourself on that at your nearest convenience. It would be a benefit to you to know where we're at, where we're headed, and how you can participate in that. Uh, Last week, we were in Mark chapter 9, which is also shadowed in in Matthew chapter 17 and 18. We were in a passage where the disciples were having a conversation about who was the greatest, and Jesus asked them about it. And they had difficulty because he brought a child, and he said, unless you become like this child, you can't be a part of my kingdom. And he began to show them that greatness in the kingdom of heaven, greatness in this thing we call Christianity, is different than the world rewards for greatness. The, the world rewards those who thump their chest, draw attention to themselves, and prove themselves. Jesus did none of those things. He proved himself with meekness and humility, by serving others rather than serving himself, by drawing attention to God, not to himself. And we learned last week that how we display greatness and pursue even our own place in this world should be modeled more after how Jesus did it than how the world teaches us to do it. Because greatness is upside down in the kingdom. And in light of that, we're actually in like part two of that sentiment in a teaching today that is very, very complicated. Jesus calls us to live out our love in one of the hardest moments of our lives. This will be less of a sermonic treatment with all the fancy twists and turns than it will be a teaching. It's a teaching that I need to point out several spots where I think that we may have mismanaged this text. Not that I'm smarter than everybody else, but history has proven that the church can sometimes take one or two verses and turn it into something it was never intended to be. It's a complicated uh, text. It's a teaching that is not hard to understand. It's a teaching that is not inappropriate for every single person in this room. It's a teaching that challenges each of our hearts is why we struggle with it. It exposes whether or not we wanna be right or we want things to be right. Parents despise doing this with their teenagers. Spouses despise doing this with one another. Business partners agonize over how to handle it in the workplace. We all have experience with it, but unfortunately, most of our experience is how to avoid it or explain it away. It's hard. I'm not suggesting it's not hard. I'm telling you it is hard. And if we wanna be obedient to Jesus, it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be uncomfortable, and yet it'll be effective. It's addressing a wrong someone has intentionally chosen to do, especially when they've done it to you. We live in a culture that says, mind your own business, and it's none of your business, I'll take care of it myself. We hear the biblical question, am I my brother's keeper? And we wanna scream, I don't wanna be. But the answer to the question is, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, you are. We feel unsafe because, you know, we all have our own stuff. I got my stuff. I got so much of my stuff, I don't have time to worry about your stuff. But the truth of the matter is, we really don't want to be judged lest, you know, we don't want to judge others lest we be judged. Another misuse of another teaching of Jesus. So we delay. We pause. We want to pray about it, you know? We want to wait. We we just want to wonder if maybe next time it'll be easier to handle it than this time. What is it that I'm talking about? It's found in Matthew chapter 18. Let's read 15, 16, and 17. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. (laughs) Wish you hadn't come to church today, don't you? Because this is a hard, uncomfortable text. The teaching's clear. 
there's not really any question about what we're supposed to be doing. But the question that stalls us from doing it is why should we do it? And if I try it and it doesn't work, was it a waste of my time? See, this teaching is clear, but not only is it clear in Jesus' teaching, it's also found in other passages of Scripture. Here's just one example. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should, should restore him gently. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. When it comes to what is right, you and I have responsibility. We're told that a good shepherd will leave, have a hundred uh, sheep and he'll leave 99 on the hillside to go pursue the one that got away from where it was supposed to be. It stopped doing what it was supposed to be doing and it put itself in an unsafe position. Not just a shepherd, but a good shepherd will leave the 99 to make sure the one is taken care of. Am I my brother's keeper, church? Yes. You see, one of the core kingdom values, it goes all the way back to the beginning, one of the core kingdom values is this. Every single person matters even the difficult ones. Every single person matters to God. Even those that if we're honest, deep down inside, we've given ourselves permission not to find as valuable. Even the difficult ones. Would you agree with me that God loves you just the way you are? Church? Okay, four of us. Let's see if the rest of you agree. <laughs> Do you believe that God loves you just the way you are? Yes. Would you also agree that he won't leave you just the way you are? Would you agree that he's been merciful and patient with you when you've not been right? Yes. But does he allow you to stay not being right? Yes. No, he looks at you and says, no, you're better than that. I grew up in a household where we were told all the time, we don't do that. And I thought, but we want to. <laughs> and I heard, no, no, we don't do that. But so at the end of the day, I realized the we was a corporate we. It was, a, it was a royal we. It wasn't me. And didn't we learn that last week? This isn't about you and me. The kingdom of heaven is welcoming us in, but we become more like Jesus than we ever remain like ourselves. So true love cares enough to confront. This is about love. This is not about being right. It's about how much we love. True love that loves God and loves our neighbor as we love ourselves deals with hard topics when they need to be dealt with. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 explains it. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It doesn't say that evil's okay because it's not messing with me. It says evil's never okay. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, because I care. Not because I'm right, not because I'm better, not because I'm more righteous or whatever term you want to use. I care because, I confront rather because I care. The one thing God's love will not allow us to do is ignore the destructive force of evil in our world and on the lives of people God loves. So let me ask you a question. If you went to a doctor with chronic pain, would you rather be comforted or cured? Think about that with me. If you went with a major physical issue, would you rather have your doctor comfort you and tell you you're going to be okay or your doctor cure you? Love cures by the way it confronts. In Proverbs chapter 9, it says, rebuke a wise man and he will love you. That might show me I'm not very wise. Proverbs 27, 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. Telling someone you love them while mistreating them, abusing them, ignoring them, doesn't mean you love them, it means you think you love them. But love is demonstrated. Love is a choice, it's not a feeling. It's a choice to give of yourself. Dallas Willard has the best definition of love I've ever heard, it's to will the good of another. To will the good of another person is to truly love them, which means love confronts. So let's begin. Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, this is a major qualifier. It's one of those things that I think we miss if we don't pay close attention to it. That's why I want to be direct in teaching today. If a brother sins against you, this is not just someone who annoys you. This is not someone who irritates you. This is not someone who lives their life differently than you think they ought to. We're not talking about our opinions on a matter. We're talking about what the Bible says. 
And if that person is a believer, then Jesus is talking to us about this context. He's not talking about just anybody. He's not talking about you interfering in a relationship that you were uninvited because you don't like the way it's playing out. It's talking about two believers, a brother and sister in Christ, where one has wronged the other and it must be dealt with because love cares enough to confront. So he qualifies this. I'm gonna give you three things that I think we find in the text, very, three very simple practical things. Number one, love enough to risk. Love enough to risk. He says in verse 15, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So it's a wise conflict management technique. Where do we get wise con- conflict management techniques? Jesus didn't get them from a conflict textbook. He wrote the conflict textbook. I've taught conflict management at the college level, and I'll tell you right now that every principle that has been proven effective to work is actually biblical in its origination. Jesus knows what he's talking about. And he says, go. It is my responsibility. It is my responsibility when I've been wronged by someone who has a covenant relationship with Jesus like I do, that as someone who loves them as they love me, I need to go have a conversation. It is my responsibility to do so. So, but when I ask myself, what is my pattern? I don't know if your pattern is this, but here's my, here is my lifelong 53-year pattern of conflict when someone's hurt me. Uh, I go talk to a few friends about it. I get their support. I get affirmation that I didn't deserve that. I get people telling me that I'm better than that. And then, if I work it really well, I get people telling me I'm better than that person. And I like all of that. And then I don't confront the person for hurting me. I don't bring up the fact that they did something wrong that wasn't beneficial to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then I just feel better about my reputation. And by doing what I just did, I made their reputation worse. That's my conflict management style. How's yours? (laughs) Mine doesn't work. Because mine is self-serving. Mine is pursuing more my greatness than it actually is pursuing reconciliation. I have to risk. Love enough to risk. Love enough to be accountable. What's implied is that our goal is worthy of the labor we put in. Sometimes the confrontation doesn't accomplish our goal. Sometimes you go have a conversation and they deny it ever happened. They reject your hurt. They, they reject the concept of reconciliation. Then what do we do? Well, we quit. No. We understand that this is bigger than our comfort. It's bigger than our convenience. Matthew eighteen sixteen. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now notice, this is not two or three people that side with you. These are witnesses to what took place. So this goes back to the Old Testament law, that you can't accuse someone of doing something wrong if there weren't eyewitnesses to it. And so it says, take some people that can help you negotiate because the end result, now, Pay attention to me, this is very important. The end result of us confronting one another is for reconciliation, not to prove who was right. It's to repair what sin has damaged the person and the relationships. So, we take the responsibility and the accountability to risk. Third, love enough to protect the community of God. And this is crucial in our understanding of the entire context of this. This is another one of those points that people get a little bit nutty with and they start assuming things and they don't ask themselves this question. And it's one of the most important biblical interpretation questions you can ask is, how did this make sense to the audience who heard it first? And from there, we can understand it. If it only makes sense to someone living in 2018, chances are our interpretation's jacked because the original audience would have been like, what? So let's read verse 17. If the member refuses to listen to them, says Jesus, tell it to the church. And what do we in Western America, 2018, instantly think this is talking about? Sunday mornings, 9.15 in this room. So could you imagine how excited you'd be to come to church? If you came to church this morning and I said, we're not really going to have a teaching, but I bring a family up here and I basically tell you all what they've done wrong and they refuse to say that we're sorry and I say these people are off limits, that would be a joy, wouldn't it? You'd be so glad you got out of bed and came to church, so edifying for your spirit, so encouraging amongst the community. We just have this public shaming, 
right? You're all excited about that, right? You'd come back. Well, see, when we take the word church, please remember this. When Jesus said these words, there was no church. There was, there was none of this. There was no day of Pentecost. There was no the establishment. The word is ecclesia. It's translated church throughout the New Testament, but in actuality, what he's talking about is the community of faith, not the organization that we talk about when we use the word church. He's talking about the group of believers living in covenant relationships with each other. So notice what he just taught us. If, if, you, if I have sinned against you or I have harmed you, you should come and speak to me. It's your responsibility to do so. Even if you don't think it'll work, trust Jesus. And you come have a conversation with me. And, and I reject it and say, I didn't do it, or blah, blah, blah. And then you bring some witnesses who say, Mark, we, we heard you say that. We, we were there. You did this. You need to understand that that's sinful, and that sin isn't serving you or the community. And if that doesn't work, then we need to grab the community of believers, not, not the organizational meeting, but the community of believers and gather together and plead and beg this person to turn from their sin in repentance. Not to shame them and make them feel horrible about themselves, but to make them see that their behavior is bringing sin into the camp. That's how we tell it to the church. We have the right, am I my brother's keeper? I have the right to look at any single one of you if you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that I have every right to expect that you'd want to become more like him than like yourself. So love confronts by simply saying, you're better than that, right? It, do you really want to live to be more like Jesus or to stay in this kind of self-centered position you're in of seeking your own satisfaction? This is what we're to do. This is why it's hard. This is why it's difficult. And when we complicate it by making it something it's not, we make it impossible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and Paul was dealing in Corinth with a church that was jacked up. It's an example in Scripture of how when people get together, they're not good at being together. And in 1 Corinthians 6, he tells them, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. We can have expectations on one another that we will live differently than the world lives. Continuing in verse 17, Matthew says, and if he, or quoting Jesus, if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Yay! That sounds exciting. What does that mean? Well, there's two possible interpretations of this. One's historic, and I don't mean the good history. It's the way the American church has treated it. And that is we give them a good shunning. You know? We just act like they don't exist. We see them in Walmart, we go down another aisle. We see them in the community, we no longer speak to them. But let me give you another possible interpretation that I think is probably more biblical. Answer this question for me. How did Jesus treat the Gentiles and tax collectors? Because he's the one telling us to do this. Did he shun them? Did he reject them or mock them or belittle them? Did he act like they didn't exist? Well, the cross would say no. And by the way, who's recording this? Matthew, what did Matthew do for a living? Tax collector. Take attention to the cues and you'll understand the context. How did Jesus treat the Gentiles and tax collectors? The same way he treated everybody, except he did not presume that they understood the kingdom of heaven nor the grace of the gospel. So he gave them the grace of the gospel by offering them the kingdom of heaven. In other words, when someone refuses to live under the authority of Jesus Christ, we ought to introduce them to the authority of Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? Through the cross, through his mercy and grace, and through the resurrection. In other words, don't, if they will not respond to the truth of Scripture, respond to them as if they're an unbeliever, not to make fun of them, but to bring them to understand the truth. Doesn't that sound more like Jesus in a shunning? Just rejecting someone and tossing them out and throwing them away? The issue is not whether or not we treat the person as saved or unsaved. The issue is whether or not they are clean or unclean in their pursuit of Jesus. And there's a reason we do this. There's two reasons we do this for the person who's done the wrong, and there's three reasons we do it as the church. Let me explain these. But I want to give you a caveat right up front. In my explanation of the two reasons we do it to, for the person who's in the wrong, 
may seem contradictory to what I've been saying this morning, but give me a chance to explain it. I use a very powerful word on purpose. The first word's easy, sorrow. The reason we will, are willing to love enough to confront is to bring about sorrow because the Bible says godly sorrow produces what? A repentance. Not a, not a worldly sorrow that's sorry we got caught, but a sorrow that says I can't believe I did that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, there was a man who had an inappropriate relationship with a woman that was not his wife. He had a sexual relationship with her. Let's just be honest. He was having sex with a woman he was not married to, and it's wrong. And he was confronted by the church in the first letter. Paul said, you need to confront this. Love him enough to confront him. It's not okay. And instead of crushing him, Paul says in the second letter, now instead you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So sorrow in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Every parent in this room has gotten our children to, under, to appreciate sorrow, haven't we? Had conversations with them about that's not okay behavior. We don't do that. That's, you don't treat people that way. That's not good. We live in a world that says if you tell anybody that any choice they make is wrong, that you're intolerant and everything, let's be honest, how could you parent if you can't sit down with your children and say that's not acceptable behavior anywhere? So we, we bring sorrow. And I know in the world today we don't want to do that. That's why it's hard. But it, it works if we do it God's way. The second is the word that's a trigger word. It's the word shame. And you may say, but you told us we're not to shame them. And I said, and I still agree. It's exactly what I told you. So what do you mean by shame here? What I mean by shame here is to bring shame on the action, not the actor. It's to bring about the necessary shame. Remember when Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the garden, what was their first reaction? They were ashamed by what they had done and what it did to their relationship with God. It wasn't that they were worthless and no longer worthy because God said immediately upon confronting them in their sin, he said, I'm gonna provide a rescue for you. He did not dismiss their actions, but he did not condemn the actor. And so I wonder, when we read 2 Thessalonians 3.14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him, do not be associated with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Weigh the cost. Now I won't go into detail, because I don't have permission, but there was an incident as a dad, one of the few times I think I may have gotten it right, or close to right, was I heard one of my sons speak to their mother in a way that just was not okay. It wasn't, it was like borderline. Based on the personality of this particular child of mine, the way they spoke to their mom would have been as drastic as, as screaming. And I heard it, and I confronted it. I didn't confront it with power, because there's no way I could get those words back. There's no way that that tone was not in the room. I saw my wife, his mom's response, and I knew her feelings were hurt, and rightfully so. So we had a conversation. In fact, I will tell you, it is the best sermon I ever preached. And it was, I, mean, I didn't get paid for it either. It was good. And what I did was I just kind of did a historical review of all the things I saw that girl do for this little boy that I never would have done for him. And I let him know that regularly. I've never done that for you. She does it all the time. You had a runny nose. She took her hand. She wiped it off. Put it on her jeans. I never would have done that. You'd have had snot for a week. And I laid out this historical review of how good she's been to him and how much she loves him and all she's done for him. And it was a good sermon. Do you know why? Because at the invitation, there was tears, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> and my child came forward repenting. And he walked over to his mama and gave her a big, big hug. She had tears, I had tears, he had tears, and it was a good day. So am I supposed to feel guilty that there was sorrow and shame? Absolutely not. Do you know why? Because the result was reconciliation. The res result was a young man who's a fine young man, who still is. And it's the only moment in his entire life we ever had one of those. It worked. If I would have just ignored it and said it's Heather's problem, because, you know, if any of you know my wife, my wife's response is, it's not a big deal. I'm like, don't. You just ruined the sermon. It's a huge deal because none of us are allowed to treat anybody else as less significant than us. Because remember the kingdom value? Every person matters, even the difficult ones. So the benefit of confrontation is not to shame the person, but to bring shame on a behavior that's not edifying to all of us. Then the church benefits too. The, the body of believers, the community. How do we benefit? Well, 
protection from any further decay. Because sin ruins everything, doesn't it? I believe this, church. I believe it is an honor to be a part of a church. I don't think I do the church any favors by being a part of it. I think the church does nothing but bring favor into my life by being a part of it. And in light of that, protect it from further decay. The testimony of the church is being whittled down by a lack of belief that Jesus knows what he's talking about. And that it can't be acceptable. Now the world can say what it wants and we're not going to convince them in in the technical means we're going to have to convince them by love, not by argument. But within the body of Christ we have a covenantal agreement that we should be able to hold each other to a high standard of holiness without question. And anybody who says it's none of your business has stepped away from the community and the covenant of the community by saying, no, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. 1 Corinthians 5, in that situation where that man was living inappropriately in a sexual relationship, Paul said, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. In other words, when a person refuses to honor the commitment of the covenant with Jesus, let them choose what they choose and accept the consequences of what's coming. Why? So that the mercy of God might reinvigorate their heart. Second, it produces godly fear. Godly fear. I know that's an uncomfortable word today. Why should we fear God? He's loving and kind. Because he will judge and he knows everything about what we've done. That scares me. How about you? Even though he's kind and merciful, it's amazing. 1 Timothy 5.20, those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. There is a standard of living that we can hold each other to. Let's not be ashamed of it. And then the last one is an attitude of restoration. Just please remember, I've given you the text, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The reason we do all of this is not because it's easy, not because it's comfortable, and not because we're right. We do every little bit of this because we care more about the person and the relationship that's being ruined by sin than we do our own comfort. So we risk, we're accountable, we, we commit ourselves completely to living this out, we protect the church, and lastly, we do it because God's glory is our motive. How does it reflect on him? Sin does not bring God glory. Sin in the church does not bring God glory. Sin unquestioned, unchallenged, and accepted diminishes the truth of the glory of God. Church, we aren't here to make ourselves feel better about the choices we want to make. We're not here to position ourselves so socially we're thought of as better because we gather on Sundays. We are here so that the mercy that's been shown to us in Jesus Christ can be displayed to others. And part of that is dealing with truth. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. I want to pause here for a moment. You're familiar with that last verse, aren't you? Because you've heard it misused for centuries. It's been used this way. Well, I can, you know, I don't have to go to church because, you know, my family and I get together and we think about Jesus and we really don't need the church. It's not necessary because where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. Time out. Is that what he's talking about here? Now, let's get everybody to relax, okay? This, this verse isn't about church attendance. But this verse sure isn't an excuse to not be involved in what God's asked you to be involved in. I'm not talking about Sunday mornings. I'm talking about the community. Because if you believe church is just coming on Sunday mornings, you've misunderstood it as much as those people who think, then Monday through Saturday, I just do my own thing. Because the church isn't your own thing. The church is God's thing and being involved in God's thing. So when we use this verse, we have to use it correctly. Here's what Jesus is teaching us. If I've sinned against you, my friend Dennis here, Dennis comes up and he says, Mark, dude, you did me wrong and it hurt my feelings and I, we're better than that, aren't we? And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I don't even know what you're talking about. And all of a sudden, Dennis shows up two days later with three people who were standing there going, Mark, you were a jerk. The way you spoke to him and treated him, it wasn't right. That's not how brothers treat one another. Jesus has called us to love one another, not to be in disagreement and contentious and everything. And I'm sitting there listening to it. And and what God is saying through Jesus in this moment is he's saying, when that moment happens, God says what you're loosing on earth and binding 
on earth will be bound in heaven. God said, I'm working in that moment. I'm freeing relationships and I'm binding relationships. I'm doing the good work because where two or three are gathered, remember the two or three witnesses gathered together for the art of reconciliation. When that takes place, God said, I'm there. Our God who reconciles all things to him is involved when love confronts. This isn't a justification for doing whatever you want because as long as there's three of you, God's in it. Now, what Jesus is saying to every one of us is, love confronts. And when love confronts, even when it doesn't always work the way we want it to, God says, I'm I'm involved in that. Because I've asked you to be an agent of reconciliation for the purpose of my glory and the development of people's holiness. It makes more sense to me when I see that. You see, these aren't just three or four flippant thoughts Jesus had about conflict management. What he's saying is, love confronts because love cares. Because the kingdom value is every person is important to God, even the difficult ones. So this morning, in light of this teaching, and I just wanted to pour over your mind and contemplate it, think about it, meditate on it, I want to ask a series of questions this morning as I conclude. I'd like you to just process with me. Who should you be praying for and be willing to speak to in light of today's teaching? Because it's not their responsibility to know they hurt you. It's not their responsibility to know they've done wrong. Jesus said we should go because we care about the relationship. We don't want to be right. We want to pursue righteousness. So who is it that you may have to go have a conversation with? Who should you be praying that God would give opportunity? And are you willing to do so so that they come to a greater holiness in the view of God? Or are you done with it? It's over. I don't want to deal with it. I've learned because of my pattern of conflict is that if you sweep enough things under the rug, one day you fall on your face because you trip over that rug. You can't go forward with all the lumps we leave behind. How will you respond if someone asks to speak with you this week? Are you going to freak out? You're like, oh, they were sitting next to me in church, and they're like, do you have 10 minutes? You're like, no! Will you open yourself up to a hard conversation if it brings reconciliation? Will you choose to listen and repent for the sake of letting the reconciling work of God change things? It may be hard to hear what you hear this week. It may be hard to realize they see the real you. They saw you at your worst moment. But are you willing to repent and simply say, forgive me, please? And church, will we choose this day to love God by how we love others, even the difficult ones? Because where two or three gather together for the sake of bringing the glory of God's truth into people's lives, God said, I'll be there. And that's what we most need, don't we? Because relationships are what make life worth living. And Jesus has showed us how to value relationships even in the difficult days. Will we love those that God loves, even the difficult ones? Let's stand together.